All right, welcome back everybody to our third and final panel of experts focused on the recovery of the southern resident killer whales. We did salmon the first week. Last week we talked about pollution. This week we're talking about underwater boats, sound, noise, all kinds of things related to the boats all around the Puget Sound area and the Sailor Sea and how the acoustics underwater affect these whales and their ability to find their food. Uh, that has become quite Quite a talker for lots of reasons and today specifically Governor Inslee signed into law new rules so we want to first start by just kind of explaining since we have several scientists here who uh, are very very well versed on this topic we'll just explain the problem why uh, is sound an issue and why is it important for these whales Dave Okay, well, uh, killer whales use sound for two things mainly. One is they make echolocation clicks and they have to hear the echo coming off the food they're eating. And as you can imagine, the echo off a of salmon would be extremely faint. So if there's too much noise, they can't hear that. Uh, the other thing they do is they communicate with each other over fairly long distances. So in quiet water, they can probably communicate uh, distances over six miles. Uh, but in the noisy water we get around here, that can get reduced to a quarter mile. So, um, you know, that's the sound side of the story. We're also seeing behavioral changes that result. Uh, so for example, uh, they do a lot of behavioral changes that require them to expend more energy. They might swim faster or they'll zig and zag to go around boats or maybe they'll just do a long arc to get from point A to point B instead of doing a straight line. Uh, they'll also do what we call surface active behaviors like breaches and tail slaps and those take quite a bit of energy. Um, on the other side of the equation, uh, noise makes it harder for them to find food. And uh, when things get too noisy, they don't even try. So they kind of know that we're not going to find anything because you know, the chances of us getting close enough to a salmon to hear it are so small, we may as well just relax and uh, you know, try to swim around the surface. And if the boats leave us alone, we can get away with that. If they don't leave us alone, then we do the zigging and zagging and trying to speed away or uh, change their dive patterns and things like that. So, um, you know, sort of the bottom line is that because the boats are there, they need more energy than they would otherwise. And because there's so few salmon left, uh, the noise from the boats makes it harder to find the little bit of food that's left. And could you also tell everybody who you are? Oh, I'm David Bain and I'm with Orca Conservancy. I'm their chief scientist and I'm on their board of directors. Anybody else? Um, I'm Marla Holt. I'm from NOAA Fisheries, Northwest Fisheries Science Center in Seattle. Um, the work that we do, um, we study the how they use sound in fundamental ways, as Dave said, to find and um, capture the, the salmon that they like to eat and other prey, um, and how they use sound to communicate. Um, some of the research um, that I've done shows that when there's a lot of vessel noise, they have to increase how loud they call. Um, and so that tells us that it's a challenge, that that noise is a challenge for communication. Um, and more recently, we're also um, documenting the exposure of noise and relating that to vessels. So we know that when there are more, more boats um, near the whales, that there is more noise. And when the vessels are going faster, there's more noise. And so that's important to document what they experience um, in their underwater environment. Yeah, go ahead, Tim. Uh, my name is Tim Reagan. I used to be at the Re U.S. Marine Mammal Commission, and before that, I was at NOAA Fisheries as well. Just for perspective, I would say that noise has really become a big issue since the 1970s or 80s, or a bigger issue, um, and that is because so many things that the human activities do or that we're doing in the oceans create noise, everything from sonar that the Navy is using to uh, large vessels that uh, generate a lot of low frequency noise and seismic tests that are used to explore, explore for oil and gas uh, as examples. So noise is something we're more aware of and more tuned into and it's important to remember that the animals probably are too because you cannot see in the marine environment the way you can on land or in the air uh, and the animals seem to rely much more on their, um, on their hearing. 
The other point, if I could make briefly, is that um, when all of this commotion started, all the debates started about the effects of noise, the National Research Council, uh, which is a branch of the National Academies of Science, held a series of meetings and developed a sort of a model that tells us why we should be concerned about sound. And it is very much like David Marlow described, where sound may affect the behaviors of animals or their ability to find food, et cetera. That in turn then causes changes to their physical fitness uh, or their condition as we call it. And then um, if that uh, is degraded enough, then it will affect their what are called vital rates, their ability to survive and reproduce. Those are the two key rates that determine whether or not a population grows or uh, shrinks or decreases, and this population is is really, really close to uh, that extinction level. So um, those are the reasons we're concerned about it. Scott, if you wouldn't mind, would you talk a little bit about the research you're doing right now underwater? Sure. Um, yeah. One of the things I like to do a lot is just listen to the oceans, try to just get in touch with what the whales are experiencing around Puget Sound. and. To do that, we've put underwater microphones around their critical habitat. And if you just listen for a while while you're working, um, you'll hear kind of what it sounds like naturally, and then you'll hear what it sounds like when a boat goes by zooming by, or um, a ship goes by, or a Washington State Ferry. Or a train. Didn't that make a difference yeah. yesterday we were talking? Yeah, yeah. Sometimes the sound comes from land into the water, um, or from air into the water. So there are lots of sources of, of noise that you can hear and that, that these whales experience in this urban estuary where we, we live. So, um, but you know, one of the things that I've been thinking about recently listening is um, there are probably some other very faint sounds that those killer whales use as, as environmental cues. You know, I think mostly we're concerned about that faint click, their own click echoing off a, a salmon that might be two or three footballs away, football fields away. Um, it's just amazing what they can do acoustically, and the cool thing about them is um, they have excellent hearing, and they're super chatty. So um, when they are around, they're almost always vocalizing. So they're great for public education. You can hear them and sort of wonder at what are they saying. Um, they whistle, they click, like Dave was saying, and they call almost all the time, um, unless they're resting. So um, yeah, that's, that's what we've been doing mostly recently is, is listening. And um, I guess the thing I want to come back to eventually is that the thing you hear most often in their environment is, is not small boats, but big ships. Mm -hmm. And can you tell everybody who you are? Oh, sorry. Um, so I'm Scott Veers, and I coordinate the Orca Sound Hydrophone Network. My name is London Fletcher, and I'm principal researcher of the Aquatic Research Conservancy. <clears throat> like you guys have said, uh, all of the ships passing can be very detrimental to the health of the southern residents, making it harder for them to catch prey. However, uh, I am not a scientist yet, uh, but we can just use common sense and see that the transient killer whales who share the same water but feed on seals and marine mammals, they are spending more time in inland water, meaning more time around vessels. And However, their population is increasing, and this is because they have a more plentiful source of food, unlike the southern residents. It's a great point to make. In fact, just last weekend, I was out and watched the transients hunting a sea lion. Uh, very close to a lot that's of awesome. boats. Yeah, <laughs> awesome. Um, so that's a great point to make, and that this really brings it back to fish. Um, you know, I'd actually like uh, Alan if we could, since we just talked about how the governor signed these new rules. And can you just give everybody a primer, real fast? What are the new rules, um, and uh, what's enforcement going to be doing about that? Well, sure. So I'm Captain Alan Myers. I'm with Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife Police. So I'm the one of the police on the water, and we are the primary agency responsible for helping to support and um, the resources that are in the state of Washington. Specifically, I command a group of very dedicated individual law enforcement officers up in the northern Puget Sound who spend a bulk of their time working with southern resident killer whales. We, in the past, have uh, worked diligently to uh, uh, enforce the laws that, that pertain to keeping folks away from or from encroaching too closely to southern resident killer whales. In the past, it's been a 200, it's been a protection zone or a bubble around the whales that has been about 200 yards. Anybody who came into that zone, we would contact, try to educate. If we couldn't educate, we would cite. This year, however, 
there's been a bunch of interest in southern resident killer whale conservation and especially within the governor's office and in the legislature and they've uh, extended that protection zone that bubble around southern resident killer whales so it's very exciting because i think it's very important for us to have a better tool in which to help impact the conservation and preservation of these species that bubble now is 300 yards from the front from the sides of the of the whales and 400 yards from the front and back of the whales mm -hmm. there's also the introduction of a seven knot go slow zone within a half mile half nautical mile of the whales so those are all really really cool new tools that we have in which to help protect them from the sound disturbances that all of our panelists have talked about mm -hmm. thank you yeah, I think that it's really good that we're all finally on the same page about the Southern residents and that we're all having discussions about them because that's something that we were really lacking in the past. However, I think that we still need to keep working hard and even though we've done a lot already, we still need to keep working to try to save these whales. Yes, of course, there's a lot of work to do. Yeah. Um, so I want to bring in the two folks who are most uh, familiar with whale watching uh, because that has really been at the center of the most heated debates. Um, the task force and sort of this last minute move recommended a ban that did not make it through the legislature. Um, uh, Don, I know you supported that. Uh, Shane, you're a whale watch uh, uh, vessel owner um, of, of, of Island Ventures, right? So um, you guys are on opposite sides of that and I did want to bring that up I, I want to say that you know there's a lot of traffic through the Sailor Sea we all know that um, barge traffic all kinds of traffic um, as everybody else has already said there um, are differences in the volumes depending on how fast you're going and the size um, but I do want to just let you uh, to both talk about whale watching because I think a lot of people who are tuning in right now probably have that question on their mind so uh, would anyone like to go first? Sure, I, I can jump in and I'd like to follow up. who you are. Oh, here. I'm Donna Sandstrom. I'm the founder and director of the Whale Trail, which promotes shore-based whale watching around the Southern Resident Orca Range from California up to British Columbia. And I'm also a member of the Governor's Task Force and the Vessel Impacts Working Group. So uh, when we were tasked with how to recover the Southern Residents, of course, there's three issues impacting the whales. First of all, there's not enough salmon. Second of all, the orcas are highly contaminated with things that don't break down, that get stored in their blubber. And third, they're under tremendous pressure from noise. And how those work together is that when they are stressed, toxins can get released from their blubber into their bloodstream and make them more susceptible to diseases. So just to paint that picture in case anyone didn't understand how they're connected, if there's not enough food, they're hungry, they might start digesting their blubber, releasing toxins into their bloodstream, they lose resistance to d diseases like us when you're stressed you might catch a cold but when you're really healthy you're not as susceptible to that so um, one key difference I want to point out is there's a big difference between salmon abundance and salmon availability abundance means the sheer number of salmon in the water availability means how available they are to the whales and that's where noise really plays a factor because if the whales can't hear to find the salmon that's out there it doesn't matter how many salmon are there and that's where noise and the whale watch industry specifically has an opportunity to help by reducing the noise and disturbance around the whales and making it easier for them to find the food that's there. That's why the task force recommended, in addition to going slow and the further, uh, the distance guidelines, we recommended, and today it was signed into law, there's going to be a permitting system for the commercial whale watch industry that will allow Fish and Wildlife to set rules for the number of boats that can be around the whales, the hours they can be on the water, and locations they can be. The goal is to create acoustic space for the whales so they can hear each other, it's not just echolocating that matters, that's really important, but they also have to hear each other. These whales have a culture of prey sharing. You know, when, a, when an orca catches a salmon, they don't eat it, gobble it all down themselves. Mothers share with their babies, and older sons share with their mothers. So they have to be able to find and carry, they have to find each other to share their food too. So anyway, that's, that's one reason we think the transients are having the easier time of it, is they have spent a lot less time they have a lot more of their time where they're not acoustically interfered with the same with the northern residents 
the, even if the number of salmon was exactly the same, they have a lot more opportunity to hunt because there's so many fewer boats around them. Thanks, Shane. Sure, yeah, a lot of good points um, that have been. Tell us who you are. Too. Oh, I'm sorry, Shane Agergard, Island Adventures. Um, I've been running whale watching trips in the San Juan since 1993, uh, over 2,500 trips that I've personally run. So I've seen a lot of changes over the years. And I'm very proud to be a part of the whale watching community and what we do on so many different levels and the changes that we've seen. It's a very caring group of people between owners, uh, naturalists, educators, um, and I heard a few things. I heard boats zooming over whales, and that was the point that the number one driver of sound is speed. And the whale watching community was the first long before the task force recommended it, we moved to a one kilometer slowdown. So commercial whale watching vessels in our guidelines have a more, uh, a bigger slowdown zone at seven knots. Seven knots is the number that has been used um, for all boats, uh, but not all boats are created equal. Uh, the larger the propeller, the slower it's moving, the quieter the boat. This is the majority of the commercial whale watching uh, boats that you see out there. These are also trained professionals that go through driver's meetings. We're very aware of all the science uh, that goes on as well. And right now, I think the best thing that happened with the task force, the new codified laws, is the slowdown zone. It's not proximity to the whales, but the sound that's being emitted from the vessels. And what we've done over many years and lots of different steps is quiet the waters and that's something I'm very proud of. I, can I just say one, sure. I, I want to say one more thing because what I think what gets underestimated is the scale and the scope of the whale watching industry. So the whale watching boats start early and they go late. There are nine companies that do sunset cruises. That last year, Soundwatch um, showed that there are 131 commercial vessels on the water every day during the peak season. That's a lot of boats per whale. And so, Sorry, Donna. Let, so I'll let you finish. So the, the, come on. It's, we don't need to mislead. That's not misleading. That is a let, fact. We'll let Donna finish. That is. Then you the, can so the, the two. Yeah, the, yeah, this is from 2017. Uh, I got the 18 report in my bag. Yep. Yep. It's 131 commercial vessels per day. And the other really. So year after year, um, the whale watch industry has grown year after year. Not true. Uh, it is true. Well, let's just and let Donna finish real fast and then Donna will give it back to Shane. Just the, finish. Okay. Go the, ahead. The, the whale watch industry has grown year after year, even as the whales have uh, declined. And I, I just want to propose that everything we're doing now is not working. The status quo, whatever everyone has been doing for the last decade, is not working. We are watching these whales go extinct in front of us. And I know for sure that nobody wants that. So I think the right thing to do is for everybody to say, what can I do to stop that? And not look for reasons not to do something, but look for all the reasons to do something. Well, to, to be fair, I think the whale watch industry has done that. Um, Shane, I'll give you a chance to respond. And then actually, Dave, I would love it if you could just talk about why uh, your thoughts on their role in um, you know, warning other boats that you've talked about in the past, but Shane, please, yeah. Yeah, that's what, one of the things that I was going to say is, you know, top scientists, uh, Dr. Bain, Ken Balcom, many others have described it as a net negative to not have the whale watching industry there. We've been described as sentinels on the water, uh, setting the example. It's the, in the sound watch data, that is uh, the 90% of violations come from recreational vessels. This is not because they want to be bad people, they don't know to slow down. The smaller the propeller through hub exhaust outboards, um, you know, Scott can talk to that as well, are the louder vessels. If you look, one of my vessels, Island Explorer 5, state of the art, large low noise propellers, above water exhaust. It's a catamaran hull, so it slides through the water effortlessly. When you listen to that boat on the hydrophone, it's very hard to detect when we are at that, at, at seven knots or less. So it, 
it is very, very quiet as far as what we're doing, but the education of what we're doing as far as protecting the animals, as far as I hear the question, why don't you just leave them alone? Because it's a net negative for the whales, not to mention the education, many other factors from, from the whale watching community bias being there. Uh, but the reality is also over the last three years, Southern residents, in, and we say Southern residents, we're grouping JK and LPOD all together, where we should be looking at them individually when we're looking at time spent in the waters here. But about 15 to 20 percent of the time is the only time that they're in the zone that we're talking about, inland waters of Washington State. They spend a lot of time out on the coast where things are, would be closer to what they would see for northern residents, you know, as far as uh, less vessel traffic. But the thing is, there's more fish and they're bigger fish. And we all know food is the number one thing that we can do, and we all want to do more. Absolutely, and um, we're all been part of the process through the rulemaking process from with NOAA. We've been part of the governor's task force, and we're looking for every opportunity we can do to help whales. But you take the whale watching community off the water; it's a net negative for the whales. Dave. Okay. Um, before I dive in on that, there are a couple things I forgot to mention when I was talking about concerns, and one is stress, and uh, what researchers have found is when food is in short supply, uh, stress levels are related to the level of whale watching activity, but when food is plentiful, it's not. So it's one of those things, no harm, no foul, but if they need to find food and they have trouble, then it is an issue. Uh, um, also, back when boats were allowed to get within 100 yards of whales, uh, we were finding they were uh, soaking up some of the chemicals in the exhaust, and that's been much less of a problem since they moved out to 200. Um, as far as the balance of having whale watch boats out there or not, um, I think there are two big positives to having the boats there. One is they help manage the traffic, and um, you know I think they could probably get better at it. And hopefully, with everybody understanding their new rules and you know detecting a whale a half mile away so you can slow down is a pretty challenging task. It's going to be a lot easier to detect the whale watch boats. So I think they can be a big help and these little boats going fast, even if they're 10 times farther away than the whale watch boat that's following the whales around, it's those boats off in the distance that will be louder. Uh, the other thing is we've talked about the importance of getting more salmon and one of the big things the average person can do is participate in habitat restoration around salmon streams and that's uh, another one of the things I work on and uh, we'll do restoration events like every other Saturday and you know we usually get like 30 people to show up for those but every once in a while we'll put out a call to the whale community and say, hey, we've got this restoration event, uh, maybe want to do a bucket brigade that goes 500 feet up the hill, so we need a lot of people. And uh, when we do ask the whale community to help out, uh, we get over 100 people. So there are a lot of people that, because they get the message from people like Don on the whale trail and people like Shane out on the water, that food is really important to these whales, um, we get the extra help uh, increasing the food supply and I think that's another thing that the whale watch industry does uh, but they could probably do better and as they get better things will get better for the whales a whole lot faster and I don't want to see that potential for recovery um, lost because there's a whole lot more tent potential recovery in increasing food than there is in reducing noise. So even if we got rid of the boats altogether, um, you know, our population probably would not make it back to 100 at this point. Would any other scientists like to weigh in, Tim, too? I know. I wanted to make Yeah, one. go ahead. Uh, one point I want to make is that it's not just the noise. I don't want us to forget that physical disturbance is also an important thing. It's hard to tease those two things apart because in most cases they occur together um, where you have mostly motorized vessels and so when you have vessels on the water you're going to have more noise. Um, but there is some evidence to suggest that even when um, vessels aren't making noise that that physical presence um, is a ch presents a challenge for the whales. I mean they're breath hole divers. They have to come to the surface to feed. We know from the research that we do 
that fish chases on deep dives take a lot of effort. There's um, a lot of um, you know maneuvering around um, for these whales, and they either chase the fish down to the bottom or they flush them up to the surface. And so, um, you know, the, the physical presence can um, interfere with that chase as well. Thanks. Else? Yeah, if I could, I want to add a little bit more perspective on this from from two points of view. One is that. We do lose these animals, um, different species, and so there's a lot at stake here. Uh, we lost the North Atlantic uh, gray whale uh, about four centuries ago, which is a long time, but then more recently we lost the stellar sea cow, and then we lost the Caribbean monk seal, and we lost the Japanese sea lion, and about the turn of the century we lost the Yangtze River dolphin. And we're now probably within maybe five years of losing the vaquita, which is a small harbor porpoise uh, down in the Gulf of California. And in that case, we knew exactly what was causing the problem, but we still were not able to get everybody to agree and come to uh, implement some real solutions that would work and save them. Uh, so. Everybody should know that this is this kind of thing, this extinction risk does happen. The other part of that that's important to realize is that if you look around this panel, panel you'll see nine people up here. And if you double that, 18, that is the equivalent of all of the females in this population that have been, that have given birth and are still alive. So we've got 18 females that determine, with four others that are immature and we hope will survive to reproductive maturity, but that's where the uh, essence of this population is in terms of recovery. If you have all males, it's great, but it will, will not bring about recovery. So this is a population where we aren't really thinking about should we go to the doctor and ask him about it. We're talking about this is an emergency. We have really got to make the changes. So to argue, we should try this strategy or that strategy alone is really short-sighted. This always happens in marine conservation issues where we say uh, the blame or the fault lies with this particular uh, factor and we're only going to correct that or it lies with something else. Really, we're at the stage where we have to do everything we can think of in order to turn this population around or we will lose it. Uh, there is a population in Alaska right now called the AT1 pod of killer whales. Hasn't given birth successfully since 1984, five years before the Exxon Valdez spill. Right now, we're waiting for it to go extinct because it just is not going to reproduce again. And as soon as the six remaining, I think six or seven remaining animals um, die, that will be the end of that population. So, so I want everybody to realize that we don't have a lot of time to try half measures, to try things that, um, you know, kind of in a half-baked sort of way. We really need to, in my view, err on the side of uh, caution and make sure that we are doing everything that is really necessary for this population. I look at London and I think, I want her to be able to know these whales, to go out and study them, to enjoy them, whatever, and I want her grandkids to do that. That may not be possible if we don't do our job now. Thanks, Sam. Good point. Do you have something to say, Linda? Oh, yeah, and I just wanted to add on, I know we're kind of past this, but on the topic of the whale watching boats, there are some whale watching boats that are disrespectful around the whales. However, for the most part, they are all very respectful of the whales, and studies have shown that during, when there are whales, they are actually some of the furthest away boats. Uh, the, big, the biggest Part of the soundscape in uh, Hara Strait in that area is actually barges. They transit through there about 20 times a day, which this can limit foraging opportunities mm -hmm. for for the whales. So that's I think we need to be focusing yeah. on and less you, on whale you watching. Wanna, you want to you want to sign up to study this as your profession forever. How old are you right now? I'm 11. 11, and you want to do this for the rest of your life. Why, what is it about acoustics that's so interesting to you related to these whales? Uh, so the most interesting part for me, I think, is the, the language barrier, if you will, uh, between, between the southern residents and all whales and humans. I think uh, if we could understand them and understand what they are trying to communicate, that would help us understand them on a deeper level and also help us relate to them and care about them on a whole nother level because a lot of people they think well I can't understand what they're saying they're probably just 
stupid animals, so why should why should I care? And I think if we if we break that disconnect, that could get a lot more people involved in or wanting to get involved. Cool. Hey, uh, Elizabeth, do we have any questions yet? We do. I was thinking we might. Yeah. <laughs> we have quite a few, but I'll group some together. Um, Barbara, Riley, they kind of ask about sound and noise outside of boats. What about planes, helicopters? I know we talked a little bit about trains, but can you talk about those outside of boats? I can speak to that. Um, we actually did a, an interesting experiment with um, some WDF, WDFW folks where we flew a Coast Guard helicopter right above the hydrophone that we have streaming from Lime Kiln. And um, a, an interesting thing about sound is it, it travels very efficiently once it's in water, but it doesn't go from air to water very efficiently. And so planes and helicopters, even if they're hovering nearby, we decided they weren't going to be very useful for like trying to herd a whale because not a lot of their sound gets into the water until the, the prop wash makes bubbles. Um, mm. So it has to be really close. Um, but I'm glad, Fletcher, that you brought up the 20 ships a day going through the core summertime habitat of, of killer whales because in my mind, that's the elephant in the room. Um, we can talk and we should keep talking about responsible whale watchers and um, what I call yahoos, the folks that are, are kind of clueless, and um, but do engage in whale watch, watching. Um, so we can keep talking about that, and I, I think there's multiple conversations, but the thing that I think hasn't been talked about a lot is the specific ships that are going through their habitat 24 hours a day, roughly 20 times a day, not just during the day when whale watching happens, but also at night, when we don't know a lot about what they're doing. But Marla's gonna figure that out for us soon. Um, <laughs> but yeah, the best, so in the inland waters, our part of the world, the, um, the best study I've seen basically looks at how much time whales are exposed and how intense the sound sources are. And it's a complicated thing to, f to figure out, but roughly one third of the noise impacts on southern residents are coming from boats. That means whale, commercial whale watching boats, regular whale watching boats, just recreational boats zooming past, clueless. Um, the other two thirds are coming from commercial ships and there are like 12 different classes of them. The, the loudest ones are container ships, and we're all complicit in that. And we're all, when you purchase goods that have been imported, they're coming on those ships. Cargo, cargo ships are the most abundant. They're a little bit less intense at the, at, at the source than a container ship, but they're much more prevalent, um, moving all kinds of grain and chemicals back and forth across the U.S.-Canadian border. And then the ones that um, I think you were talking about, Fletcher, are tugboats. They're not really loud at the source, barges, but they, they are very, very slow moving. So they'll take like an hour, two hours to go through the habitat. Um, and then commercial uh, passenger ferries, like Washington State ferries, they don't overlap a lot with the summertime habitat, but they're quite persistent throughout the years. So BC ferries is pretty concerned about their potential impacts yeah. right, right at the mouth of the Fraser River. So anyways, I think there's a conversation about each class of ships that I hope the vessel working group mm -hmm. at the task force um, addresses and, and the, Governor Inslee has a, something called the Maritime Blue Initiative which has all the right industry players to really solve, um, well take advantage of the good news about the noise issue which is that if we can get rid of this type of pollution the problem just goes away like at the source if you quiet it mm -hmm. the pollution goes away whereas the, the chemical pollution is horribly persistent. Or even the habitat issue. I mean, that's a, that's a years-long um, problem too, growing uh, the Chinook. So it's it's an interesting um, field of study. Uh, yeah, Alan. Yeah, could ahead. I just add to the answer? Help answer the question. One of the points too that we're seeing now that's becoming problematic is the um, introduction of UAVs or drones, and we've had in recent years a couple of cases, investigations that we've had to make involving individuals who have flown drones in, uh, either from a vessel. Uh, or uh, from land and flown them right over the top of the, the of the moving and feeding pods, and 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 you can see, uh, in through our investigation, the disturbance occurred from the air. So I would highly encourage folks that are drone enthusiasts, and that seems to be everyone these days, mm. uh, or it, it's a huge uh, burgeoning type of new hobby for folks to to keep in mind the impact that those drones have on wildlife, especially whales. Great point. 
I've got a small thing to add on that. These whales also, these are the same whales who were captured in the 60s and 70s. And often uh, the captors oh. used noise bombs and smoke bombs from planes and helicopters to herd them, to scare and herd them. So. Um, there is a limit, there is a, a threshold, there is an air limit uh, above the water too. The, the, air, the southern residents have had startle responses when helicopters or planes are going too low. So that's not, that, that is a very serious thing and should, shouldn't be dismissed, especially because of their cultural history and sensitivity to air noise. Oh, you guys have your own. We'll keep this over oh, here. Uh, I just want to touch on this really quick, but uh, so you're talking about the ferry, the passenger boats. Uh, so they are very loud and slow. However, uh, I was talking with Dr. Ingrid Visser in New Zealand, and so the boats, the passenger boats, they are very fast and they're very quiet. However, in New Zealand, they have a lot more boat strikes per year than we do here, and that's because the whales, they can't get out of the way or detect the the boats quick enough to, to get out of the way and so they have a lot more whales hit per year but and that could be very detrimental to our whales because they are it's a lot less of them there's 200 around the whole of New Zealand about and there we only have 75 so we did have well, one. Well, and in fact, right. the last uh, the last three adult whales who've died that we've been able to necropsy did not die of starvation. The last adult whale who died died of a blunt force trauma near Powell River, BC. Mm -hmm. The other whale, Rhapsody, died of septicemia from an unborn calf, and the third, L95, died from a, a fungal infection likely introduced through a researcher's dart. So we have to identify the real problems so we can solve them. And I want to echo what Tim said. We, we have to avoid the trap of saying, it's this, it's not this, it's not this. This is a both and situation. Yes, we have to bring back salmon. Yes, we have to reduce toxins. And yes, we have to reduce noise from every sector, from commercial boats, like the ECHO program is leading the way in Vancouver, bringing all the commercial shipping boats. They slow down. They've actually started a program where they alert professional mariners when the whales are around, so they slow down. The commercial sector is actually changing what they're doing to protect the orcas. Um, so that's, that's the spirit we need to be successful, is it's all of this and it's all of us. And picking apart is, is not gonna help the whales. And also emphasizing what, what, what Tim said, there are 75 orcas. These orcas at their historical low were at 71. We know they can recover from 71 because they have. After, they were, after the captures were stopped, they came back to a high of 98 whales in the mm -hmm. mid-90s. If they go below 71 whales, there's no evidence that says they can come back. And especially, as Tim said, with the pressure of only 18 reproducing females. Mm -hmm. So we must give them every possible chance to find the food that's there, to, to communicate with each other. And the only thing we can control in the short term is noise. It takes a while to grow salmon, and it's gonna take a long time to figure out how to stop putting toxins into the water. The bills, the governor's bills today affected all of those things. You know, that's, it's really exciting. We have a strong legislation in each of those areas. But the thing that's gonna give most bang for the buck for the whales in the near term, that's what I'm really worried about. We've got four or five years to turn this around and then it's too late. So what can we do now? And that's where reducing boat noise from every sector matters. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more with Donna, and that's actually a little bit unusual because we see, don't always, we have something very in common, we love whales, and and that puts us on the same team. We go about things sometimes differently, um, but what the reduction in sound due to slowing the vessels is a big thing. And you talked about vessel disturbance. Most of the work that's been done around vessel disturbance has been at much closer distances. We've talked about toxins. Our motors are tier two and tier three emissions exceed California emissions. Most of the whale watch boats have invested in their infrastructure for cleaner burning motors. Um, I mentioned that I've been doing this since 1993 and I've seen lots of changes and we need Dave, Dr. Bain talked about getting better we've continued to get better 
every single year. It's a very organized group. We take this very seriously and there's changes. We had guidelines before anybody knew what guidelines were. Since 1996, we have been tweaking our guidelines as a, as a whale watching community in the best interest of the whales. Now, thanks to the great science that's being done between D tags and understanding sound and what we're doing, what they're doing at night, I think the whale watch community is proven that they want to do everything that we can to adjust behaviors voluntarily. Another example is that is we were slowed down at one kilometer long before there was a recommendation from the task force. So the slow speed is something that I think is great work and I think it's enforceable. And I think that everybody understands the importance of quieting the water. And um, yeah, that's something that is, I, I think been echoed all the way through the whole process. Yeah, I guess w one of the things I'd like to get across right now is that I think you're hearing different perspectives on some of the issues and, and those perspectives don't often align. One of the problems we have in conservation is that we often pass uh, regulations, we implement or we produce new reports, we implement new laws, et cetera. But if we don't implement those new rules and regulations well, it really doesn't make a difference for the population we're trying to save. So that's a real critical shortcoming of, of our efforts to conserve many populations. And it, this is a case where, uh, at least my reading of the SoundWatch report is, is that there are still thousands of violations or potential violations of the rules and regulations for watching these animals. And many of them could be from people who don't know better um, but in fact, when you look at the SoundWatch records, what they suggest is that when enforcement is not there, people are much more likely to create a violation uh, uh, than they are when the enforcement is there. So they must know that what they're doing at the time is, at least some of them must know, is not right. Um, the other part of it is that, uh, frankly, I, I, I have been in the position where I've really advocated for whale watching, but we always have to keep in mind that ultimately the population we're whale watching has to be able to tolerate whatever we're doing. And the question now is, are they tolerating it? I think it's great that we're reducing the noise, um, but even if you stop a boat in the water and leave his engine running, it's still making noise. Uh, so those animals are not in a clean, quiet environment. While you've got this year, I think there was an average of 12 boats within a half mile of whale woods, and that's down, which is a good thing. But, but uh, uh, they are still subject to noise and, and other factors. So the, the difficulty we have in developing regulations and implementing them and enforcing them, we never give enough support to our enforcement people, uh, means that our ideas that we carry out in a place like this aren't always really well implemented in the field and they don't then have the effect that we're seeking uh, on that population. And again, this is a population that doesn't have a big cushion. It can't afford for us to fool around here. I really appreciate the the uh, words about enforcement, and you, he's he's absolutely correct. You, the data supports that when law enforcement is present, violations go down, and folks start to act according to what we want them to act. But to that point, I think in order for this species to survive, everybody, everybody has to be their own police officer. Everybody has to be their own enforcer. And that's what I hope that this panel conveys, the message conveys. You can never put enough cops on the water. Mm. You can never have a cop on every corner of any street where the crime is pervasive. But what stops crime and what will save this species is when people in mass start to understand the rules, understand the importance of their behavior and change it to affect those species. And that's what I really, really hope comes out of this. But I'm not saying don't support enforcement, please, please do. <laughs> and talk to your friends, right, and people you know about the rules. And if you're out on the water and you see something, should they report it, Alan? Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> what do you do? Yes, absolutely. Um, we have several uh, hotlines that are available, so when people see a violation, they should report that violation. It's similar to our poaching hotline. Uh, when, when that uh, uh, violation occurs, or you see something that you think is untoward or, or out of sorts, don't hesitate to give us a call. Now, we cannot promise we're gonna be there in an instant, but we'll be there as soon as possible. And we have some of the best criminal investigators uh, anywhere in the country 
that are able to track down information that may be cold. So don't think that for a second that, oh, yeah, it's probably too far past and we can't do anything about it. If you saw something, you give us some actionable intelligence on that, some, some things we can use to go on. We'll make that case, but we need your help. We need people to be engaged. Where do people go for the number, or do you know that right now so we can just tell people? Off the top of my head, no, but where they can go is to our website, WDFW, okay. or you can go to any number of other websites. Whale Trails is a great example. There's all sorts of um, NGOs that are out there that have uh, links to the sites that will allow you to report violations. And any one of these concerned citizen groups that are out there have the ability to contact WDFW enforcement right on the spot. One of the primary groups that helps us uh, with violations that occur is our commercial well watch folks. Thank you. This gentleman right here and his crew are some of the most instrumental in helping us stop violations as they occur because those uh, that group is a, is a whole uh, sort of force multiplier of eyes on the water that are able to communicate directly with my law enforcement officers and, and help stop the problem. Um, and it is something that especially in the hot summer season becomes a, like herding cats that there's, there's problems to be had for everyone. So the more we, we have from people like the, the whale watch industry or other NGOs like Whale Trails and others who, who are uh, acting as our eyes can really help stop the problem and save that species. Can, oh yeah, go ahead, Scott. Real, real quick, again. One of the words that I didn't hear come up yet was compliance. Whether it's a law or a guideline, there's not always a cop at every street corner, there's not always people anywhere, but the understanding of why the law exists, why the guideline, why the best practice that we do is we're running our own boats. Like I say, the SoundWatch data was really interesting. 90% of the violations came against sport boats. This is not because they're bad people. It is, actually, I have it. The, um, <coughs> Yeah, three percent came against U.S. eco tours. Six percent came against kayaks. So there's a lot of education that we need to do. But the people that are close to the industry certainly are aware. But the compliance to any changes is something that um, has been absolutely there amongst the. We have a private fleet radio, which we have um, communication boat to boat in real time, and that is also another great tool to encourage compliance, whether it to be a law or a guideline or best practices or just the right thing to do as we're slowing vessels down, not just on their approach, here's a big one, on the departure. When you're leaving the animals, as you're coming off, you have to exit the area very slowly because you make just as much noise when you're leaving as you do when you're coming in. So this is, again, it's a lot of education still to be done, but we've come a long ways and we've got a long ways to go. Yeah, today in particular, I think we have a lot to celebrate. We've got a, a bunch of new rules that I think will help um, with some historic problems. Um, hopefully a lot more funding for increased enf enforcement. Um, but one thing that I think the public can advocate for, which I, I see underfunded on both sides of the border, is when we're doing all of these great mitigations, trying to help the whales, slowing down, um, slowing down ships, like you mentioned, the, the folks in Canada are doing voluntarily, we need to watch what the whales, how they respond. And that means funding science. Um, I'm very proud of what the, the ECHO program up in Canada has done, but the one thing that makes me um, really disappointed is that they're slowing ships down. And if you don't, if you, our research shows if you slow down a lot, that's, that's a, probably surely a good thing because it reduces the peak level the animals experience. And if you slow down enough, um, the, the amount of noise that reaches them is actually not even above the natural background level. So if you get that quiet, it doesn't matter that you slow down. But if you just slow down a little bit um, and you're still a really loud shift going through their habitat, you may increase the exposure um, of that mm. animal because you've increased the duration. Um, so if you're gonna slow down, whether you're a private boat or a commercial ship, you should slow down a lot um, because it may be that the quiet periods are really important to them. And since we haven't funded the, the studies of what they behave like when it's really quiet, um, we don't really have a baseline. And so that's, that's one place that when we have a permitting system in place and uh, well-behaved operators on both sides of the border, and at least in Canada, um, funding for entities like NOAA's equivalent, um, we'll be able to monitor and understand what the whale's natural foraging behavior looks like when it is really quiet. 
So I think that's something that's that we should advocate question. for on the U.S. I, side, too. Oh. Marlet needs more funding. <laughs> Let, let's take a quick a question real fast. And we'll, is that all right? Yeah, I, I do. Okay. Um, excuse my pronunciation on this, but Devere asked, how does a recreational boater know where whales are so they can avoid them? Uh, do you want to answer that? You can hand the mic off. It's like, the, it's, well, who wants to be a millionaire they know, or something? They know where the whales are because of the whale watch fleet. That's how everybody knows where the whales are as they watch for the whale watch fleet. I think well, the, I, I think the, he, he asked specifically with no warning or presence of a whale watching fleet. How do you know? That's in the sound, it depends on where you're at. If you're in the San Juan Islands, there's a new, uh, there's a new, San Juan County has started an initiative to fly flags when the whales are around. Uh, so that's one way of um, alerting boaters in the San Juan Islands. Through the rest of, uh, w one of our goals is that anybody Anybody operating in the marine waters of Washington State needs to be educated about who the southern residents are, where they're likely to be, and how to spot them. So that you can see a spout or a dorsal fin and understand they're nearby and understand what the, rare, what the whale watching uh, laws are. And as Alan said, that you, that people become internally persuaded to do the right thing for the whales and follow that whether there's enforcement around or not. That's where we want to get to, and we're not there at all. I, yeah, the the uh, question specifically is if he's out in his recreational right. vessel and he's prawning or crabbing or recreating, fishing, whatever he's doing, how would he know where the whales were? And there's really not a source to go to to know where those whales are, but it's keeping a diligent watch you know always as a boater you're looking for logs you're looking for wildlife you're focusing your eyes as far as you can see anything closer you will see anyway and when you do see a whale then you will know how to behave but there's um, there's going to be times there's going to be times where you are up to speed in a recreational vessel and you come across a whale and you go whoa I didn't know that guy was there pull it back slow down whether you engage in whale watching or disengage in whale watching, that's where you pull it back as far as the behavior of a sport boat. Uh, Fish and Wildlife, will they see it all the time. They are looking for intent. If your intent is to get close, you're gonna get to sign in triplicate. They know good guys and bad guys. So through, if you were just, the question is if I'm out of my recreational vessel and I'm just cruising along and I get surprised by an animal, what do I do? follow the laws that have just been codified, slow down and hold appropriate distances. Yeah, so with killer whales, typically all you see are the dorsal fins up above the water. Uh, in certain weather conditions and lighting conditions, you might be able to see the blow. Um, but if you're close enough to see them, you're probably in that half mile go slow zone. So you should slow down right away. And if they're directly in front of you, then you should start moving off to the side. So, um, you know, when we studied the effects of masking, we found that noise from directly in front was more of a problem than noise off to the side, and that's why we have that longer distance in front than we do on the side. And uh, we don't want boats running up behind them because uh, that kind of makes them feel like they're being chased, and that's one of those stressful things we want to stay away from. Um, occasionally you'll see bird activity so uh, as was mentioned earlier the whales share food with each other which means they're breaking it into smaller pieces and sometimes the pieces are too small to pass on to another whale and a gull come down and grab it so you can kind of keep an eye out for that and then also you know if you're out on the water um, and you're a local you probably know where whales are likely to be at different times of year and if you're going 20 knots, that's a three minute mile and whales can do three minute dives routinely, which means that you actually need to spot that whale a mile and a half away, because uh, if it goes down for three minutes and you, know, you go a mile and you, know, you were closer than that, then you're on top of that whale. So uh, if you're in an area where you know whales are likely to be, uh, maybe just take it easy and go slow. And you know, you don't have to. We love gray whales too. <laughs> yeah. Slow down around Hat Island right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
you know, so you ran a piece last night about boat running over gray whales mm -hmm. and wasn't interested in gray whales at all. It just kept going, mm -hmm. but it went right over the top of them, mm -hmm. uh, even though the whale watch boat was, you know, blowing its horn, trying to get its attention and, and you know, just wasn't able to get it to avoid the whales. Go ahead, uh, I think an important part of getting people to follow the regulations is education. Uh, I think if people knew more or if they started learning it from a younger age, it would it would make people want to follow the rules more and that's actually why I started my nonprofit, the Aquatic Research Conservancy. Mm -hmm. We're trying to spread awareness through education and having a curriculum on southern residents in the ocean in schools I think could really help because if we start enforcing that hey you need to go slow around whales here are the guidelines mm -hmm. around whales from a younger age people would be more likely to follow them because they would grow up knowing oh if I see this whale I'm gonna go slow and mm -hmm. this is what it looks like and this is what I should do so and do they talk to their parents too do you think kids mm -hmm. would talk to their parents yeah I think Whales, and especially orcas, they're such a charismatic uh, species that it, a lot of kids, uh, it gets them really interested and engaged, and when kids are really interested and engaged, they will talk to, to it about their parents, and that's, that can be a really beneficial thing. Mm -hmm. Tim? Uh, London, I, I really think you should get together with Donna because I think the two of you have a lot in common in terms of education and the things that y you're interested in. I, I wanted to make a couple of, or maybe one main point about uh, what we're talking a lot about is boater behavior on the water. And we've had different numbers kind of flying back and forth here. My reading of the Soundwatch report really doesn't quite jive with, with a lot of those numbers. So I, I basically want to encourage the audience to look up that Soundwatch report and uh, see if uh, what those numbers are and see what makes sense to them. If I read that there are several thousand violations, um, actually the data that I saw suggested more violations from the eco-tours on some areas, U.S. and Canadian combined, than on the recreational boat. So um, it'd be good if we could get a little bit straighter on, on just what's going on out here, but this is a real problem. Education is a real problem. But again, if we're not following the rules, the rules don't help. And Marla, can I put you on the spot? I want to ask you about, didn't you do a paper where you wanted to determine if the regulation change from 100 to 200 yards had a significant effect in the distances of boats from the whales and and uh, my recollection of that paper was that there were not big differences in the uh, in, in the distances from the whales with in that case is that right so you're talking about the the comparison of before and after yeah. the implementation yeah. of the federal reg regulations um, so that so the implementation happened um, in May of 2011 and we collected data before um, and then um, s a couple of years after and we did f we didn't find a distance effect um, but um, you know and you would expect a distance effect because sound as it travels through the water it um, it loses strength through um, sound propagation loss and uh, but that's if all things are equal before and after all other things are equal before and after um, but that distance doubling is the thing that changed. Um, there was some indication in our data that not all things were equal after the regulations went into effect. So we saw that there was more, the boats that were around the whales were more likely to be not stationary and stationary being either shut down or in idle mode. They were more likely to be um, going slow, medium or fast speeds. And so any effect of of the noise being reduced by that doubling of um, the distance could be a trade-off with an increase in speed, and so that that's that's one of the things that we um, we suggest in our findings. Uh, Shane brought me this 2018 Soundwatch. I usually do my own public records request, so I'm going to trust you on this one, but it does say recreational vessel operators, motor and sail accounted for 90% of all incident types in 2018, followed by eco-tour kayak operators with 6%, Canadian eco-tour operators with 5%, U.S. eco-tour operators with 3% of all incidents for a combined eco-vessel incident percentage of 14%. Um, I want it, we're almost out of time, um, which is not surprising because I had a feeling, you guys want to look at this? I don't know. No? no? 
Do you want this? Can I respond? Yeah. yeah. Well, um, sure. Oh, very quickly. Yep. There are a lot of categories of uh, violations discussed under different conditions, and to just grab one set of them, I don't think will give you the whole big picture of what that Soundwatch report really says. So, so again, I would just encourage people to go and look for themselves. We need that educated public. If you read it yourself, you can have more confidence in it. It looks to me like it's a very well done report generally. Awesome. Elizabeth, I did want to take, like, if we had one or two other questions, I know we've been kind of yeah, the questions. Um, I think sort of overall it's, I mean, Ernie had asked this one, which might be a good one to end on. Would boats with electric motors help? Or honestly, how? what's the best way that somebody could reduce noise from any sort of fishing vessel um, that they could do? Okay, well, the best way is to slow down. Um, you know, Marla talked about getting like a 6 dB change by doubling the distance you watch from, uh, but you can usually get at least a 20 dB change by slowing down, and that's why that half mile uh, slowdown zone that the governor signed into law today is so important. Um, there are a variety of powertrains that you can use. Some are quieter than others, um, so, Probably jet drives tend to be quieter than propeller boats. Uh, larger propellers tend to be quieter than smaller ones. Um, there are two main noise sources for most boats, and they're about equal in intensity. Uh, one is the banging around of the pistons in the engine, and the other is the cavitation of the propeller. So going electric gets rid of that banging around, but it doesn't get rid of the cavitation and may not result in a big change. But if you can acoustically isolate the motor from the water so that the banging around doesn't get into the water and you change the propeller, then you've got a much quieter design. And then um, you can also, um, you know, like I said, go slow because that slows the propeller, which makes it make a whole lot less noise and uh, you don't have as much banging around in the motor and uh, you don't have the splashing in the water and things like that. I, I just want to say quickly that one of the things the task force had recommended, because these are very hard questions to answer, how many boats can be out there, where can they be, all that, no one can actually sit here and say what that is, what that number is, what's a sustainable number for, the question is, what is the sustainable wa whale watching look like for this population? What is sustainable for the population? We have to put what their needs first. No one can answer that. So that's why we were persuaded to by two things. One, that the southern resident orcas lose five and a half hours of foraging time every day due to noise and stress from commercial vessels and whale watch vessels. That was a paper that came out in 2017. It was front page news in the Canadian papers and it wasn't mentioned here. That's pretty significant. Five and a half hours a day they're effectively blinded by noise. They can't find the same that's out there. So we as a task force thought our priority gives them 24 hours a day access to finding the salmon that's there. We recommended, because this question is so hard to answer, let's just stop all whale watching for two years until the permitting system is in place. We recommended a moratorium on whale watching on the southern residents. I want to be really clear, no one ever said whale watching has to stop. No one ever said whale watching are bad guys or this is a bad industry. No one ever said that or believes it. What we believe is that the southern residents need a break and we ask the industry to cooperate and all recreational boats. This was going to apply to everybody. Create that acoustic zone around the whales now. The problem is and that that was fought, uh, it was unanimously recommended by the task force, it was forwarded by the governor, and it was um, rejected at the legislative level. So I'm sorry for that, um, but I do want to say there's still an opportunity and I would like to encourage the whale watching industry to consider just leaving the southern residents alone. Give them space to find what food is there. It, you might be right, but you might be wrong. You're very passionate, and I appreciate Blending that. Pass the microphone. Don't mislead what happened at the task force meeting, because you were there. You know it was not unanimous. It showed up in the last half of the last day with a very bold recommendation that came from Fish and Wildlife. It, it was very, very interesting. Let's just say that. But we do know that there was a lot of people who abstained. There was a lot of people. It wasn't a unanimous vote. So again, I want to work, for, work with you 
work alongside research, conservation, looking very forward to the future of Southern residents and what we can do, but we don't want to mislead on exactly what happened. It was near happened. unanimous. There were okay. two people who did not. I, I'm, I'm not misleading, <laughs> and I don't want to be accused of that. We don't have time to go into this, but you know how it went down, Donna. You do know how it went down. Okay, so since we're almost out of time, Elizabeth, I'm guessing no more questions? No. Okay. Uh, I like to end the panels by giving everybody an opportunity to just say one thing that, um, and if you want to just, let's, we could start with David and then, uh, or unless Alan, you feel like you want to start and we just go down the line, um, just one thing that people can do to, uh, to make it better for the whales. And I do just want to say, I know we've been kind of talking a lot about whale watching, but as Scott has, and others have brought up, I mean, the boat, problem is a big problem besides whale watching boats and so and I have not heard a whole lot of answers regarding commercial vessels so uh, I leave that out there too as something that I would like to know more information about but either one on the end want to start and we can kind of, but go ahead Dave what okay. can people do um, well I think uh, when you're out on the water kind of think about the commercial whale watch fleet as crossing guards in a school zone and they're not going to write you a ticket but they are going to let you know when you need to slow down uh, when the whales or the kids are moving through and you kind of need to you know, slow down and wait off to the side and when the whales are passed, then you can speed up again. And I think, um, you know, a lot of them, I think they're gonna start flying flags so that you can know when they're watching Southern residents versus when they're not. Um, and those boats are gonna be a lot easier to see than the whales are. And I think the reason the task force recommendation failed in the legislature is when people had more than a few minutes to think about it, they realized that, you know, we all agree that we need to make things quieter for the whales, but the whale watch industry has a role to play in making it quieter um, because they're not out there in isolation. You've got, you know, the commercial ships going through, uh, you've got, recreational fishermen going through that would probably prefer the whales are not there. Uh, you've got um, recreational boaters that want to see the whales and may or may not know the best way to do that, but if they can just kind of pull up next to a commercial whale watch boat and do what that boat does, uh, then they're probably doing the right thing. And uh, like I mentioned, that slowdown is going to quiet things by about 20 dB. Uh, the increase in viewing distance from uh, 200 to 300 is probably only going to be about 4 or 5 dB uh, reduction in noise. So that slowdown is the big thing that everybody can do. Well, I would say that you've heard a lot about science and the role of science in this issue. But ultimately, I don't think this is a matter just for science. This is really a matter of what our vision is for the future and how careful we want to be about making sure that these killer whales are here for our kids and our grandkids and future generations and how precautionary we need to be in the way we manage this situation. Scientists, and I was one myself, um, we like to study things and we'll study them to death. Um, but in some cases, that is not what you need. You need to be able to make good decisions uh, that will save the population and do, then do whatever science you want to in, ad in addition to that. With 18 females that are reproducing, this population doesn't have time, so we can't afford it. There are a lot of other things that I would really like to be working on. The big ships, maybe we can reroute them. We rerouted them off of the, uh, off of the Boston Harbor and, and so on. So we could look at that. We need to look at this question about dams and how to make more Chinook available. There are multiple things that need to be done here. Um, we need to pick, we're not picking on this one, we need to pick those things though that we can do quickly and get them done just because we don't have time. If the population gets in much worse shape, it's going to get that much harder to turn them around. So, so this is about the future that, that we all envision for ourselves and our, and our future generations. So while you're thinking about our future, um, go to orcasound.net and listen to our live hydrophones. Um, June is coming and the Southern residents hopefully will return, so you get to listen f for their wonderful calls. But while you're doing it, every time a, a ship goes by and, and ruins your study or work environment, um, 
call the port commissioners in Seattle or um, contact the governor and say the Canadians are doing a lot to quiet commercial ships and we should, um, you know, for you can actually go to marinetraffic.com and you can figure out what type of vessel is making the noise as it goes by our hydrophones and then talk to the, the company that owns that ship. You know, start, let's start talking about those each type of commercial ships. Um, I want to say one really important thing first is not to give up. Don't sink into cynicism and don't sink into despair. The whales aren't giving up. They're still getting pregnant and they keep trying. We cannot give up on them. And we have to put all of our best minds together and we have to move boldly forward to try some new things because what we have been doing is not working. This state has a proud history of conservation. In 1976, Washington State sued NOAA Fisheries to stop the permit for the SeaWorld capture that were occurring and near and decimated the, these same pods removing one-third of their population we didn't argue then about how much money SeaWorld was going to lose and we didn't worry about the commercial interest of SeaWorld's brand what we said was these whales matter to us and you will not keep harming them and putting them at risk and I think we're at the same point we need to say are these whales a commodity? Are they something to be exploited and made money off of by lots of different people? Or do they have the right to exist for their own sake? Are we not the luckiest people on the planet to share this urban fjord with this magnificent species that's been here for tens of thousands of years? We have about a minute in time to get this right. We've brought them to the edge of extinction in one human generation. We can turn this around, but the only way we can do it is by putting their best interest first. Uh, I didn't talk about this a lot, but I think what we need to do is one thing everybody can do is they can call Governor Inslee. I don't know his number offhand, <laughs> but you can Google it. Uh, <laughs> and, I got it for you. Oh. <laughs> uh, and tell him to breach the Lower Fourth Snake River dams. It is the the fastest way to recover Chinook salmon populations and but one call is not going to do it we need lots and lots of calls if it is going to make a difference okay so me being a scientist I am a proponent of being evidence-based um, so I would say be well informed do some research um, and then take action based on that and be critical of your sources there's a lot of stuff going around but be critical in your thinking about the problems and all of the different problems and how they interact these risk factors all interact with each other um, and so that's my plug Okay, um, I'm going to follow London's lead here and talk a little bit about fish of my last couple minutes. And one of the things that we do as a company and our industry does is uh, a lot of salmon enhancement projects that we're aware of. Uh, Skagit Fisheries Enhancement, Nooksack uh, Fisheries Enhancement. We've also been looking at one called the Souk Salmon Project that's doing great work on the BC side. These are groups that are producing fish that come back to the inland waters. And this is really important. The, one of the big reasons that these southern resident killer whales, especially J-Pod, is not spending nearly the time in these waters is because there's not nearly as many fish going to the Fraser River. This is a, you know, when they are here, when the whales are in this area, the salmon population is way up. And a lot of times they're spending more time on the coast. So if we want to watch whales in Puget Sound, in the San Juan Islands, in the Straits Wanda Fuca, we need to put more fish in the water. And that's going to cost. It's going to cost on for, between our hatchery programs, we need uh, habitat, uh, coastal rivers, but really the big ones, the most important 10 miles of real estate to J-Pod is not the west side of San Juan, it's the first 10 miles of the Fraser River. So whatever we can do to put more fish in the water, this is how we save the whales. Okay, last but not least, uh, I'll say that um, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to everybody here on the panel and to hear everybody's uh, well-informed views on things. And as a law enforcement officer, what I'd ask for folks to remember is be educated. Be educated about the laws, not just the species dynamics, not just the ecology of whales, but be educated about the laws that help protect them, that help ensure that they're around in the future. Uh, this is a species that we can love to death, folks. Um, it's one in which is very susceptible to uh, the presence and the, and the sounds in the water. This is facts. 
and we need to watch that and we need to watch our activities around them. Uh, us as law enforcement officers are there to help, but again, we're just a tiny fraction of the, all the eyeballs that can be out there to help us do our job and to help the species thrive. Thank you. Thank you. And I did look up, if you're going to report a violation online, it's wdfw.wa.gov. The governor's phone number is 360-902-4111. So <laughs> thank you guys so much for being on our final panel. There's a lot of passion on this panel and there were on the past ones and um, you know, the stuff that we're the most passionate about and that means the most to us, I think as a reporter I found brings out the best and sometimes the worst in us and I hope that these whales bring out the best in us and that that's what history shows to have happened. We appreciate your joining us for these three conversations and that you will continue to do your part to make the future a bright one for the Southern resident killer whales. Have a good night.